I was in high school, I was in a traveling choir. Now, I, I know that doesn't sound very cool. And uh, as I'm saying it, and as the words are coming out of my mouth right now, I'm realizing that it really wasn't cool. But I thought it was cool. Um, we traveled around California, like up and down it. And uh, you may be thinking now, oh, well, that is kind of cool. Um, we... Uh, we had this thing that we wanted to do. It was called Magic Music Days, and it was at Disneyland. And what Magic Music Days was, was you got to go behind the scenes in Disneyland, and you got to be trained by the people who trained the performers at Disneyland, and they would train you on how to sing, how to do choreography if you had a group, like we had a choir, or they would teach you how to do special band stuff. Um, but you got to go do that all morning, and then you got to sing in Disneyland, or you got to perform in Disneyland for whoever's walking by. And so our choir thought this would be awesome. And I, when I was a junior, we applied for it and we actually got accepted. And so we took the uh, four and a half, five, six hour, I forget how long it took, drive down to Anaheim, California to go to Magic Music Days at Disneyland. And we, uh, we got a behind the scenes look at Disneyland. We got to, uh, to drive around on these little like golf carts and and look at like uh, what actually happens behind the scenes. We got to see the people who train all the performers. We got to see Mickey Mouse without his hat, like, hat on. It was kind of cool. It freaked some of the people in the choir out because they were like, Mickey Mouse is an actual person. You know? And so we got to see all this cool stuff. But then the, the coolest thing was we went into this room. It was like a green room. And there was this big, huge mirror. And we got to like learn how to do choreography as this 40 person choir. And we got the cool thing then was we got to go into the park and we got to sing in this place called Orleans Place. If you've ever been to Disneyland or Disney World, you'll know that where that's at. And uh, all these people walked by and we got to sing. We did some show tunes, all this stuff. We got to use the choreography they showed us. Uh, but the coolest part of the day was that was over at 1 o'clock. And then they gave us the rest of the day and night to be in Disneyland with our friends no parent supervision. We only had like three chaperones on the trip. So we got to spend the whole day and night in, in Disneyland. It was so awesome. Point of the story is not anything about Disneyland. Point of the story was on the way home. Uh, we were in a bus, okay, and we're driving home, and we want to stop for lunch, and we pick Taco Bell, okay? Now, I don't know. It was probably a bad decision for 40-plus high school students to pick Taco Bell for lunch, in Los Angeles, because if you think about it, 40 high school students, Taco Bell food, six hour bus ride home. Not a good combination. Actually a pretty explosive combination. But uh, anyway, we get into Taco Bell and we cram in there. You know how big Taco Bells are. We had 40 plus people going into Taco Bell. We all get in there, we sit down, we get our food, uh, we have our trays and everything. And we, we eat, and we get, all, we get done eating, and my, one of my friends gets up with his tray, and he's got all his trash, and he starts walking over the trash can, but like halfway to the trash can, he turns back to us, and he just starts busting up laughing. And we're like, what is he laughing at? He starts pointing over to the corner and like still laughing and making faces. And we kind of notice, oh, there's like maybe like a couple in the corner like making out or something. I don't remember what they were doing. The reason why I don't, we don't really remember, like I still today, I, I talked to one of my friends this week, we still don't remember what was going on in the corner because we were watching him. And the reason we were so focused on him was he wasn't watching where he was going. And he was like looking back, doing one of these like, like that, and wham, he slammed right into the window next to the trash can. He had his tray out like this, and you know, the, tray, the trash goes everywhere. His like drink's still half full, and it's like all over the floor now. His face planted into the window like this. There was like spit on the window. There was like, he pulled away from the window and there's this big face grease mark on the window. Everybody in the Taco Bell was like busting up laughing. All of us, the, the people behind the counter, like the workers, they're even laughing at this guy. The only person who didn't think it was funny was him. And he just kind of walked, clear, cleans up his trash and throws it away and walks back. And I started thinking about this story this week because of what we're going to talk about tonight. The fact that a lot of times in life, what we think is important really isn't important. And what we tend to focus on isn't really what we should be focusing on. You see, life kind of has this way of kind of getting in our way. To uh, we, we just start focusing so much on what we think is important, what we've got going on in our own life, that we, we might miss what's really important, or in this kid's case, we might hit 
what's really important to be paying attention to. Uh, I mean, if you, if you think about it like in the fact of what God is doing in our world, a lot of times I think we get into this trend where we get so focused on ourselves and so focused on what's going on in our life and so focused on what we think is important that a lot of times we could be missing what God is doing all around us. And we, we just get this idea that, that our life is the most important thing that there is. And God could be saying, hey, look, there is a whole lot more going on here. Sarah and I were uh, having dinner the other week, and um, we're sitting there, and we start talking about uh, the idea of sponsoring a child through Compassion International. Um, we, we talked about that like two weeks ago, like OSM is going to sponsor for every $5,000 you guys raise through Strive, we're going to sponsor a Compassion Kid, and so if you raise like $10,000, we'll sponsor too. Well, Sarah and I, after that, we talked about, hey, we need to do this as a family, and so we just got into this conversation. The other like half of my brain is thinking, though, we're also talking about we need to buy a house. Like we live in an apartment right now, and it's getting kind of cramped. And so when this conver- as the, the further this conversation goes on, my mind starts thinking, wait, well, right now like we need to buy a house, and it, it's really hard to try to find one we can afford as it is. And now we're talking about like an extra thirty-two dollars a month sponsoring this compassion kid. And, and I'll be honest with you, I really struggled right there in that moment, thinking about. I don't know if I, w- I can sponsor a Compassion Kid because I, we need to get a house. And I started thinking about us and me and, and my family. And then I had to really, I struggled through it and I had to stop. And I had to pause and I had to think, okay, what am I doing here? Like, why am I, I thinking this way? And, and I realized that I, you know, I, w- I want to provide for my family, but really it came down to the fact that I wanted what, what, what I thought was best for me instead of really what maybe God wanted. And what he, and I thought, you know, and I stopped myself, I said, and I told Sarah, I said, I'm just being selfish here when I say this. And so I need to stop, because, and we need to just sponsor a compassion child, because I don't want to miss something that God could do through that. Uh, like a couple weeks earlier before that, another instance happened where uh, Sarah got, a, uh, got this chance to go to Haiti. She's going to go to Haiti in a couple weeks um, with the church. And when she told me about it, my knee-jerk reaction was, well, you can't go. And the reason I, I said to her, you can't go, was because who's going to take care of our 18-month-old son? You're going to leave him here with me for a week? That's probably not a smart idea. And I started thinking, well, I can't handle him and do my job, and I can't do all this. And so that was like early in the morning. I left uh, my house. I came to work here, and I just sat in my office, and I just I started thinking about the things I was saying to her. I called her up, and I said, Sarah, you know, I... All the things that I said this morning were really from a selfish vantage point. They were from seeing things from my agenda and maybe not seeing things from like God's agenda and what he wants to do through you. And so I said, it was all selfish. I'm really thinking that God wants you to go on this trip. And so she's going to go. But I I guess I tell you these stories to, to let you know that a lot of times in life, God may be wanting to do something, but we're so focused on our own life and what we've got going on that we're walking around life, but we're kind of, we're looking down. And we're not looking up to see what God maybe is doing all around us, but we're just so focused on us and we're so focused on what we've got going on that we're missing what's going on around us and what God could be doing through us and, and around us. Uh, there's this Greek philosopher, his name is Plato, and he used to, he, he told this analogy called the cave. I don't know if you've heard of it before, but this is basically what it was. These, these prisoner guys were in a cave and they were chained to the ground and they were made to look at a wall in the cave. And every single day of their existence, they looked at this wall and there were shadows that passed by on the wall. And so that's, they thought, this is life. This is it. These shadows on this wall that we watch all day long, this has to be what life is. One day, one of the prisoners was set free and he walked outside of the cave and he saw people walking around and he saw that there was life outside of the cave and you realize the shadows that were cast on the wall inside the cave were really because people were walking outside and there was real life. He got so excited, he walked back or he ran back into the cave to tell the other prisoners, guys, there is more than looking at these shadows on the wall to life. There's life outside the cave. It's bigger. There's something better going on here. But nobody believed him because they were so focused on the wall 
And they were so focused on these shadows on the wall that that's all they could ever buy into. And that's all they ever thought life was about, was about these shadows on a wall. And they were missing life completely. And my fear is this, as I think about that analogy and as I think about where we're going with this series. My fear is that a lot of us get so wrapped up, even myself, get so wrapped up in what we've got going on in our life and